Thanks very much. Uh, glad to see lots of familiar faces here today. Um, this talk is would in, initially the the title is a long walk for a new library in Nepal, and uh, it began with a different trek that I'm going to talk to you about today, uh, and I'll explain the reasons uh, for that. Mostly uh, weather, slippery rocks and moving slower than ever required a change in plan. So that's one of the nice things that uh, I traveled with a company called Third Rock Adventures based out of Kathmandu. Um, and they, they were all set for me to do a, a trek to a place called the Makalu Base Camp. And um, when that wasn't gonna work out, they were able to pivot essentially on a dime and one evening, we changed the trek and had to make all sorts of new connections to do that, and it worked out fine. Um, so if you do decide to do trekking in a place like Nepal, you do want to go with a company that knows what they're doing so they, they can do that. Um, and in fact, now you can't trek by yourself in Nepal. You have to have a registered guide with you. Um, and that's probably a good idea because uh, you can die up there. You're up high. Uh, my original trek was going to take me to about 14.6 for its high point, and I changed everything around, and I wound up going to about 14.5. So I got to the same elevation. The big difference was the first trek would involve up two, 3,000 feet, down two, 3,000 feet up 4,000 feet, down 1,000, up, down, up, down, up, down. The trek I did was more like a continuous up, turn around, and a continuous down. Much, much easier on an aging body, I might point out. Uh, and then Bonnie mentioned 10 friends. And let me just give you a little info about 10 friends. Um, 10 friends is an organization based out of sisters here in Oregon started by two high school teachers, basically, uh, who, at Sisters, uh, who went um, to Nepal to visit, and essentially, I think it's, it's fair to say, fell in love with the country and the people, um, and wanted to do something for them, and created a small nonprofit, essentially, uh, to do that, and as they, uh, worked on it, uh, it slowly morphed from what they did to the point where uh, they're supporting and are still supporting a small orphanage in the town of Bhaktapur, and you'll see some slides for that, uh, a, a Himalayan education center, which really isn't the, the school, it's a place for these young women to stay and to learn, but they go to a regular school in the town of Kandabari, where the uh, center is located. And then recently, we've merged with another nonprofit um, called uh, Elevate Nepal. And Elevate Nepal is working to support, at this time, a small village in southern India, uh, excuse me, in southern Nepal, right near India. Um, and the residents of that town uh, at one time would have been called untouchables. And now they have a, a slightly nicer name, but the impact is just the same. They are uh, socially the lowest of the low. Uh, and very hard up for funds, for respect, for education for their kids. And we're trying to help res uh, get that problem addressed. And then in addition, uh, <laughs> Currently, one of the things that we do is uh, create small libraries in isolated towns, but town's too good a word, villages, gatherings of people uh, in the mountains in the Everest Makalu region. And I decided for this year, I wanted to help create a library. And we're going through a new library here in the Bend area. They're looking at the sort of the same thing in Redmond. 
And so you're thinking, wow, you know, 10 million, 15 million, 25 million dollars for a library? I'm going to talk to you about a $5,000 library today. And that library proportionally probably will mean more to the people of the small village than a $20 million library will mean in a place like Bend, just because they had no library. And the original trek that I had planned out was going to take me to Bhaktapur to visit the uh, orphanage and then to uh, Kandabari to visit the girls' school, then to the town where the library was going to be dedicated, and then finally the trek. And we were able to accomplish all of those things, just a different trek got involved. So with that, and you'll see lots of pictures of mountains like the fresh slide. It's really hypnotizing. You can watch this one mountain um, for a whole day, and it's, it will change all during the course of the day, depending on how the sun is hitting it and the shadows that are on it. Uh, so it's just fascinating to see these mountains. And this guy is um, about, I guess, 6,300 meters or so. And 6,300 meters will roughly translate to, you know, 20,000 feet. It, it's one of the little guys out there. <laughs> so these mountains, you know, sometimes you don't realize how big they are because you're already up high just looking at them. Um, but they are huge. They, they really capture your imagination. So let's see if we can, oops, oh, there we go. So the plan of attack. Part one of the program is going to be the trek that never was. That's the trek that I didn't do. And um, we'll talk, Good Works is visiting these locations that I mentioned and then changing the itinerary. Then part two is the trek that actually happened and that's onward to the Long Tong Valley. Uh, a beautiful, um, a beautiful trek, accessible to people who hike, basically. It's not a mountain climbing trek or anything like that. Um, and because uh, we changed the itinerary, we were able to uh, fix the speed of the trek by building in more rest days than you might normally have on one of these treks. If it was a group of 20-somethings, they would never be resting, right? They would just keep re-walking and sleeping as they walked and keep going. <laughs> uh, we found that with you know, current age, it was wise to take breaks. Let your body recover a little bit. Doesn't mean you just sit all day. You can walk around locally and enjoy the, the local scenery, but you're not under a, a deadline. If you gotta be at this location that night because there's, that's where the room's reserved for you. So, let's see, uh, if I can get, I don't know, can you see the little green arrow on the uh, thing when it moves? Okay, so the original trip was going to be down here in the Makalu Barun National Park. And to put it in context, right next to it is Sagamartha National Park, that's Everest. Then up here is Langtang National Park. That's where the actual trek occurred. And then roughly, because I had to eyeball it in, here's Kathmandu. So we're really on the center or eastern side of the country. So the first place to visit, which was just a, a drive, but when I say just a drive, just a drive in Kathmandu is a life-threatening event. <laughs> <laughs> you, and and part of the problem is if you sort of like quote the guest of honor, you get to sit in the front seat next to the driver, <laughs> which you see death staring you in the face all during this period. There's just so many cars uh, merging and unmerging, uh, you know, sort of like sides of the road are advisory, not required, you know, so it's in, and the traffic is incredibly crowded there. So, 
a, a trip like from here to, uh, from Ben to Sisters, you know, 20 minutes or so. We did a drive to this Bhaktapur, which is not much difference in distance. You know, you're talking an hour and, and you know, thankful when you get to wherever you're going. <laughs> so right here, this is uh, the Durbar Square in Bhaktapur. Uh, in the 2015 earthquake, and we'll have more to say about that later, in the 2015 earthquake, the towns of Bhaktapur and Kathmandu were hammered. They suffered a lot of damage, as did most of the country. And so you go to the um, uh, Durbar Central Square, basically, in Kathmandu, and there's, there's still construction going on from the 2015 earthquake trying to repair the damage. And um, it is crowded beyond belief. It's a big tourist attraction, essentially. And whenever there are festivals, and believe me, there are almost always festivals, you know, if you, you think sisters and, you know, something going every weekend, some kind of fair. Well, Nepal is like that countrywide. There are all these very long Hindu festivals that are go going and schools close for them. Um, and this area here would have lots of people for some of these festivals celebrating. And the nice thing about the Durbar Square in Bhaktapur is it's not crowded. You can walk around and you don't feel like there's a mob pushing you around. So it's very nice and very pleasant. And the air is much more breathable, literally, in Bhaktapur than it is in Kathmandu. Kathmandu has, it's better than when I was there five years ago, but it's still not healthy air to breathe from all the vehicles and the dust and things like that. So you really want to get out and start trekking when you're in Kathmandu just to get the fresher air of the mountains. And this is just a scene, this is where the royal family would bathe and the, the cobra would spit water out on, into the area. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure I'd want to you know, take a shower underneath a cobra, but it's quite large. Uh, it's hard to, to gauge from the picture. And then this is an older picture. These are the children at the Hopeful Home Orphanage. That is one of the uh, activities that 10 Friends supports. And when I was getting ready to do this trip, um, I did a fundraising campaign, and a lot of folks who are here were kind enough to contribute. Um, essentially, I was raising money to pay for the library, and then also to try and raise a little bit extra to help the orphanage, the Himalayan Education Center, which is where the girls are up in Kandabari, and this little town of Tilly, Tilhai, in southern Nepal. And as it turned out, uh, my goal was to try and raise 7,000. That would pay for the library plus a little bit for these others. I was able to raise 15,000. So fully paid for the library. Thank you. Yeah, and thank yourself, especially if you gave. Uh, uh, and I was able to raise 2100 for each of the three other locations. And here at the school, uh, or at the orphanage rather, the, the money went to buy uniforms, uh, outfits, for all of the children at the <coughs> orphanage. Because to go to school in Nepal, you wear a uniform. You just don't put on your blue jeans and head off to school. So we were able to, I think uh, 16 children got complete outfits uh, thanks to the generosity of folks all around the country. And this is a much more recent picture of all the kids. And one thing that was really nice, when I was there uh, five years ago, um, they have, they're always very welcoming to, to visitors. And I think it's a good thing, too, for the children because um, it's not expressly stated, but it's kind of, I think, experienced by a lot of these children um, 
here's somebody who came across an ocean half a world away to visit me. I must, must be something good about me that they would come this far to, to stop in and say hello. So I think it helps the children with their own self-image, even if you're not doing anything but showing up there and, and, and maybe having dinner with them. So it's something to think about that you are doing volunteer work of sorts, just visiting some of these locations and conveying to these kids the message, you're, you're worth something. And they may not have heard that ever before. And so there was one little girl at, when I visited there five years ago, and uh, they were dancing and I was sitting and she was sitting in my lap and we're keeping the beat and stuff like that. And she's still there, only five years older. Uh, and of, of course, I was five years older too. So. Uh, so it was really nice to see the school, or see the school, the orphanage, and all these kids are going to school, and the schools that they're going to uh, teach English and Nepalese. So they're becoming bilingual. So hopefully this is gonna help them once they leave the orphanage for jobs, especially in the tourist industry, which is a key industry in Nepal. So something that we're real happy about. Then, so that was a one day trip. He had dinner with the kids. I was able to take somebody uh, from Third Rock Adventures, the trekking company up there, because I'm trying to get the trekking company to, uh, build into some of their trips and treks visits to places like the orphanage. Um, and maybe if, you know, if you were going on a 10 day trek, you might say, I'd like to do two days of volunteer work at the orphanage and put that all into one trip and make it easy for people to do. So, and, I, and they're receptive to that. One reason is the orphanage here, the Hopeful Home Orphanage, is educating kids and preparing them for a future. There are a lot of orphanages in Kathmandu, and many of those orphanages are operated to make money for the owners. Uh, and the kids are a means to an end, not the end in itself. So, and uh, that's one thing that you'll see when you, if you were to visit uh, the orphanage that we support is that the kids are at the center. Well taken care of, well fed, sent to school. Try, if, if someone wants to go to college, we'll try and support them to get them through college. So, and, and some have done that. Anyway, after that, we're essentially gonna start on the, the trek that I was planning to do, which is the Makalu Base Camp trek. And so you get to Kandabari, where the uh, education center is located. And when you get to Kandabari, it's a, a, it's a Jeep ride, four wheel drive, but not really. You could do it, you know, a, a Subaru, which is sort of a, a tame four wheel drive vehicle, uh, would be fine to get from the airport to Kandabari. From Kandabari, we did not have to go very far to this town called Num, N-U-M. And from Num, we'll be able to walk to the town where the library is gonna be. To get to Num, you take the Jeep trail from hell. <laughs> <laughs> this was, first of all, we were a little late. The airline was late getting us started. Um, and then we drove to Kandabari, had lunch, and then started this drive. It wasn't too long after we got started, the rain began. Then it got dark. We had a flat tire. It took about seven or eight hours on the highway. And you can see kind of, you know, it's a two lane road, right? There's one lane and we're in the other lane. And uh, that's a picture of me taking a picture of the road there. Uh, one, one thing to bear in mind when, when you're doing these trips is that the, the roads can be really scary. 
And once again, guess where I'm sitting, right next to the driver, looking out the front of this vehicle. And uh, you'll see it even more later, but if you look at this, look at this picture, you know, sort of the, the road and the edge of the cliff kind of seem to get really close to one another, and they do. And we're driving it at night in a rainstorm, and it, it's probably good in some ways that it was at night because I could not see very far out the windows to, to realize what I was in, but uh, quite exciting. So here's, here's a little map, and uh, on your, when you're looking at this, the same as I am, I guess, the uh, little dot to the far left up, on the, up to the top, that's Tumbling Tar, that's where the airport is. So you fly to Tumbling Tar, and then you drive a relatively short distance to Kandabari on pretty decent road, paved road. Then from Kandabari, you get the Jeep road from hell. And you see the little arrows pointing to the Jeep road from hell. And they take you to the uh, town of Num, which is the little red dot about in the middle, furthest to the right when you're looking. That's Num. Then our target for where the library is, is the town of Kokotak. Uh, if you try to Google map and find Kokotak, you don't find it. <laughs> if you just put in Kokotak into and general search, you get advertisements for God knows what. They, they no, none of them find it. It's on this map because this map is an actual trekking map. And I took a picture of the trekking map. It's the only place I found that actually had this little town, little village on the map. And it's a, it looks like, you know, oh, that must be a, a, a ways away. It's a very short walk, basically. But the walk did teach me a lesson, which was the the rocks were very slippery because it had been raining up there. <laughs> Rain was forecast for the next several days. And um, the trip I was going to take was going to start in Num. And the first thing you were going to do was drop down about 2,500 feet, cross a river, and come back up 2,500 feet to the town of Sedgwa. That was your first day. And I realized pretty quickly from the speed at which I was walking that it was going to be hard to maintain a pace that would get us from town to town, from stopping place to stopping place. And on this whole section, the guide and the porter were, were with me. And I think the the guide was thinking the same thing, but he wasn't saying anything. Uh, and so that night, uh, when we uh, came back from visiting the library, I uh, talked with the guide and said, I think, essentially, I, I'm trying to bite off more than I can chew with this trek. Any ideas? And I, he was obviously thinking about that already. Um, and he suggested the Long Tong Valley, which is a shorter trek. It's a more developed route. This Makalu route is a very recent mat one. Um, so there may be like one place to stop in certain places, and that's it. Um, and. The driver who brought us up the Jeep Road from Hell was still in Num. So we made a decision that night to talk to him and say, don't leave. Uh, I think tomorrow we're going to turn around and go right back down that road back to Kandabari, and then back to the airport, fly to Kathmandu, and start over again and do a different trek. And that's what we wound up doing. So this is a Google map picture of the area. Uh, you can see Kandabari 
I don't know how well, whoops. Here's Kandabari right here. There's the awful road take, and takes you to Num Bazaar. And then you see another name, Num, just floating out in space. So Num floating in space is probably the name of a district. Num Bazaar is the town. And there are lots of bazaar, uh, Namchi Bazaar on the trek to Everest. This is Num Bazaar, you pass a lot. Bazaar is like a, a market town. Uh, that's basically what they are. So this gives you an idea of what the topography looks like. So a, a lot of steep, steep cliffs. It's very lush there so because you're still pretty low. You're not up in the real high country. You don't see snow in this picture, for example. So this is the road. <laughs> it made enough of an impression. Uh, my amygdala was in overdrive for most of this. And so as a result, there are several, there's a whole section, as you can see, on the road. This is the road right here. If a truck comes around that corner up ahead, one of you have to back up because there ain't no way both of you are going through there. So quite exciting. There is a truck. This is in a little town, little village. Town is, is too big a word. Little village. Um, lots of these big trucks. They're doing some hydroelectric projects in the area. And the net result is huge trucks, heavy trucks, traveling these roads and just ripping them to shreds. So apparently the road several years earlier was actually in much better shape. But now big trucks ripping it to shreds and people are passing because who wants to sit behind something like that? Uh, it looks like you got a foot of clearance between the truck and the cliff. Eh, go for it and zoom <laughs> around they go. So exciting. And the, the pictures don't make the road look that awful. The reason that's the case is because the only time I could take pictures <laughs> is when I was not bouncing up and down or side to side. And that, those were the good parts of the road. And there you can see road, cliff, watch, watch your step. And, and like the fellow who brought us up there and turned around and came back with us, there are people that are driving that road you know, every day kind of thing for, you know, six to eight hours. So more power to them. Then this is Kandabari in the Himalayan Education Center, or the heck. And this is what the, the countryside looks like right by the, the education center. So there's lots of greenery. They grow a lot of uh, food at the education center for themselves. So they have uh, chickens and pigs and goats. They're growing bananas, uh, millet, all sorts of food there. So it's nice they're, they're not totally self-sufficient, but they are in a position to grow their own, a lot of their own products. So that's nice. Again, another shot of the area around there. So it's very pretty. Uh, this area typically is not going to get much in the way of snow. Uh, one thing that was interesting to me, the last time I was there, I was doing two high, alti two high altitude treks. And um, so you're going from uh, Kathmandu up to fairly high le uh, elevation very quickly. On this trek, I was going to be uh, down lower. And the CDC says if you're below 6,500 feet in Nepal and not in Kathmandu, watch out for malaria. And so I, I was on malaria medication for most of this trip uh, because of that. And this is uh, a scene in Kandabari, which is a nice sized village, nice sized town, uh, of a, a Saturday market kind of thing just like you might find here. All sorts of uh, vendors uh, with their products. 
the gal who is the director of the education center accompanied me and uh, the porter and the guide and she was apparently their current rooster is perhaps not performing up to code <laughs> so she was and she grew up in a very small village and so she's going around checking out roosters and figuring out which ones look like they might have the oomph to, to work. So it's kind of interesting because, you know, it's, she, she's used to doing things like that. I, I would go you know, like that to a rooster. But uh, in any case, though, it, it worked out and we, we visited there uh, and then went to a, uh, a Nepalese burger joint for lunch. <laughs> that was rather interesting. And then uh, had an opportunity to sit down with the young ladies who are at the center and have a question and answer session where they had questions about me and what I was doing. And if you look at, uh, in there you'll see my uh, porter who's at the far end of the table and my guide who's closest to, this, to you. Uh, we're also there, not, part, not really part of the Q&A, but participating, being there which would be an unusual experience for a guide and a porter on a trek normally. They'll, they'll get you to where you're going, they will serve you your dinner, you'll order what you want at the tea houses, which are the little local hotels. They'll bring you the food and make sure everything's good. And then until all of the tourists are fed, not just you, but all of the tourists are fed, they, they sit around and wait. And, and once we're taken care of, then they eat. So for them to sort of participate in an activity is somewhat unusual. So, and, and in some ways makes, I think makes uh, like my guide uncomfortable. He's not used to that. That's not the normal way of doing business. Uh, but he, you know, he adapts to it. Um, and I think it was probably of interest to him to be at a place like this, which, you would not normally on a trek be sitting down for something like this. So it was a good experience. And then this is a set of stairs coming down from a street to where the actual center is located. And when I was there, it, they were just the steps. And one of the things we were able to fund was putting in this railing so that there's now railing on either side of those steps. So there's considerably safer to do that. In addition, we're able to um, raise money, or the money that was raised could be uh, put towards uh, tables and chairs for where some computers were going to be placed. And into some cabinets, they have a little guest house for the, for the uh, rooms in the guest house. So once again, we're able to help out uh, the uh, education center with some things that they wanted. So that, again, was, was nice to be able to do. Then, Kokotak and the new library. So you saw that map that showed the distance between the two places. It was, it was maybe like a two hour walk. It was actually fairly warm and humid there um, because of the elevation. They're, they're, again, they're not that high. And I was then told how the, you'll see a picture of the library shortly, how the library got to Kokotok. The uh, woodwork and the putting together of the physical library, uh, and it, it's, you know, don't think of it as a place like this. Think of it as shelving, essentially. Um, it was, was put together in Kandabari. Then from Kandabari, they got it to Num on the Jeep road from hell. Well, from Num to Kokotok, there's no road. So 20 men carried the library on poles to Kokotok, as did the books go the same way. People carried them. Uh, I don't think you'd see that here, where <laughs> folks in Bend would, would go down to the UPS center and everybody would pick up a 50, 60 pound 
box of books and walk to the new library. But that's what they did. So it's pretty amazing. So when I was there, it was for the dedication of the library. So this is the first time that the books are going to be there the f and, and made available. So a real dedication to the, of, the, of the facility. And lots of shots, lots of, it's at, the library is located at a school, um, an elementary school basically, but it's a community library. So the books will include books for adults. There'll be English, Nepalese dictionaries. There are a few books in English, most are in Nepalese. They might have translations of uh, books that kids here would read in English. They would have it in Nepalese for you know uh, stories that we've had in our youth, you know, Sleeping Beauty or something like that translated. So all the young kids were at the ceremony, and they're like kids. You can see they're all in uniforms, um, and they're bouncing around. They're happy, uh, enjoying life. They know a big vacation is coming up of two weeks, so naturally they're happy. A lot of dignitaries, the, the folks on the left side of the picture seated, essentially is like the, the Board of Education for the school, the village elders who are involved in uh, high level management of the school district. And then there were all sorts of speeches and talks. Um, I gave a little one, but then it had to be translated in, from my English into Nepalese. Um, so that was, it, mine was relatively short, but some of these, I have no idea what they were saying, but what the heck. So what's happened here is they've laid down a bunch of mats on the ground and those packages in front are where the books are. And now they're gonna take those packages apart, put the books out on the mat so the, everyone can see them. And these are some of the villagers sitting around on the school grounds, there were more up above, but it's a village event. Uh, the only ones who really weren't there were the, were the kids who were in the higher education levels. They were all up in, con up in Num taking classes. So the walk that we did to get to Kokotak and then back, they do every day to go to school. So significant little walks, but it's one reason why obesity does not seem to be a big problem <laughs> in the village. Whoops, what do we got here? Mm, let me close that. So here are all the books and um, the only thing, I, when, they, when these books got pulled out, the kids just naturally, no one said go look at the books. They just, boom, they're all over there. And what it reminded me of is you see pictures of a feeding frenzy by sharks. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was a book feeding frenzy as all the kids are coming up. And you can see if you look in the distance, there are kids at the tables, they're looking through the books. And then they, they, you know, they have to, the, the adults are keep telling them, bring the books back to the pile and stuff like that. And some of the uh, folks from the Board of Education, I'll call them, but like the uh, school district managers, they had books too and they were looking at them. So it's a big event when something like this happens. And I was happy. <laughs> it, it's really pretty, you know, to sort of know that you helped to bring this about and then to see all these kids, eyes lit up, looking at books. They probably, none of them, maybe nobody in that village has ever seen this many books in one place. And so, real impressive event for them locally. Um, and then you see I'm wearing a, uh, a little badge. Uh, I'll step out of the camera. Turn to the field of view. So this is the little thing. I, I think it says guest of honor. <laughs> but, but I can't read it. So it, it 
just might say something like, humor the strange old man or something <laughs> like that. But it was pinned to me, so, <laughs> and, it, and no one kicked me, so. Uh, but that was kind of fun. And then there's the library. That, and that's tall. I, I could barely, full stretch, reach the top of it. And that's glass in there, a lot of glass. That came up that road. And then on the, essentially on the shoulders of 20 men to carry it to where it's sitting right now. And then this was done up there. So a few spelling errors and letter errors and that, but it doesn't really matter. I dedicated the library to the memory of my parents and my brother and in honor of uh, actually the brother of the gal who runs the Himalayan Education Center. He had been killed in a helicopter crash a little bit before that. So the only thing I'm gonna ask them to do, it says in memory of Eleanor, and it should say Weinberg, but an E got lost and a G got turned to a Y, but who cares? <laughs> Essentially, I know what it means, but they left my dad off, so I'm gonna ask them to add him back in. Uh, but again, a pretty something pretty special, so really happy about that. So from, from there, actually, after the dedication is when we actually went to the Himalayan Education Center. So I, I'm a little bit out of, uh, I showed you the Education Center first and then the library. Um, so a real good experience to see where the, the money that I had raised was going. The one place I did not see was Tilhaig, it was not part of my trip, uh, but I know that some of the folks who run the High Camp Restaurant and Sisters, Nurba and Pima uh, Sherpa, they're over there now. Um, and they were, they got from my fundraising essentially $2,100 for stuff that they wanted to take to the village. Most, most of it's for the kids. So clothing, uh, school supplies, whatever the kids need. So now to a, an actual trek. Uh, and the, the trek we did was called the Long Tong Valley Trek. The elevations in here are estimates. And uh, one reason they're estimates is I, I'll look on a map and I'll get it, the elevation of a town like this first town, Saya Brubesi. Okay, good. Then I'll look it up with a Google search and it's got a different elevation. <laughs> and then I'll look on another map or maybe on a, uh, some statement from a trekking company and I'll have another elevation. So I would try to make my guesses as roughly what the elevations were like. So this will give you an idea. We're starting at about 5,000 feet, and in two days, we're gonna go up to 10,000 feet. And it, it's at that point where you wanna start thinking about taking Diamox, which is a high altitude medication to give you some protection. <laughs> then from Godotabala, we went to Mandu. Mandu is a little over 11,000 feet, and the plan there was always to stay there two days for acclimation to the elevation. Then from there, went to Kianjin Gampa, which is somewhere between 12,500 and 13,000 feet. Uh, it's not a floating city. It's got an actual elevation. I just don't know what it is. Uh, and we stayed there for two days. And... Uh, on the second day, went up to Kanjinri viewpoint, which is a roughly 14.5. And I was thinking about it, the, the distance or the elevation change is about 1,800 feet, roughly. Uh, Misery Ridge is about 600 feet. So this is sort of like three times the elevation gain of Misery Ridge down at Smith Rock. But the Smith Rock Trail 
looks like a super highway next to the trail here. There is lots of scree and little pebbles and stuff like that on this guy. And you're going up, you're at 14,000 feet. That's the other big difference between this and Misery Ridge. Um, but we got there, just beautiful as could be, and I'll have some pictures of that. Then it was back down to Mondu, and this was an interesting trek because there was one free day built into the trek where I could say, this is where I'd like to stay an extra day. And that's pretty unusual because that really screws up the planning for everything after that. Uh, but I decided I really liked Mandu, beautiful views. Uh, so we spent a, uh, came down and uh, spent two days again at Mandu. And again, it's nice because it's, it's a, a chance to rest, especially on the way down. The knees take a beating on this kind of trip. So we left Mandu and we're started down. The plan was to go to Goda Tabula at uh, roughly 10,000 feet for the night. Well, best laid plans, as they say. The trek was overrun with people. Uh, normally, in uh, the Hindu holiday that was going on, people would return home to their home villages to be with family. But not only is their diet being westernized, some of their other customs are being westernized. What do we do with long holidays? We go traveling. We don't go home to visit anybody. Go travel. Got the time off, do it. Well, there were lots of Nepalese trekking. Uh, and there were more people trekking than there were rooms on the entire trekking route. And so we had a reservation at Gode Tabula, but for one person, me. If they kick me out and a group of eight people come up, eight people can go in that room and they can collect eight times the amount of money. So they essentially, you may have a reservation, but they don't care. You're not going in. So we kept down from Mandu, got to go to Tabula, nothing in the inn. Kept going to a place called Lama Hotel, which is actually like a little village. No, no rooms in the hotel. We finally got down to this little town called Rimchi at 8,000 feet. And it turns out my guide and the son of the owner, and the son was there, are school friends. So no rooms, but there was a little patch of grass we could put a tent up. And just by chance, we had passed some folks with a tent and had been talking with them. So my guide ran back to where they were staying, got their tent, brought it here, laid out a tent, put it up, uh, had a sleeping pad about that thick, <laughs> and nothing but rocks down below. <laughs> so it was not a really good night's sleep, but at least it was out of the wind and any weather. Um, stayed there. What then, was the temperature, Larry? What temperature? temperature? Temperatures were not really too bad, so they might, it might get down uh, close to freezing at night, but not horribly cold. Um, and if you're out of the wind, it's, it's, it's doable. Then the, the next thing was uh, at Rimchi, we were going to see if we could find a place in between to stay for the night before going all the way down uh, to Saya Brubesi, uh, but there were none. So I said to the guide, let's just go down and get it over with, and we'll stay an extra night at Saya Bubresi and let the knees recover, and that's what we did. So instead of coming down roughly uh, 6,000 feet in three days, we came down in two days. Mm -hmm. And so that's just a constant pounding. And, it, and you say, oh, well, 6,000, you know, 3,000 feet roughly to come down. It's not the end of the world, but it's not a, a nice, gentle s slope. It's down, up, down, down, up, 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 down, up. So lots of ups and downs. So that 6,000 feet of difference from Mandu to the uh, Saya Brubesi was probably on the order of maybe 
uh, 6,500 feet, maybe seven, but I don't think that much. Anyway, that's, that's what life is like. Here's a picture. Uh, here is that Saya Brubesi, and notice here it's a P, other places it's a B, so who knows exactly what the spelling should be. And then up here is Kanjin Gampa, which is the last place we stayed for the night. And if you look down here, and just look at the thing, we were basically coming up a river valley. And that's the Long Tong Kola. Kola is the word for river. So Long Tong Kola is the river, the Long Tong River. And then here is Long Tong Lirung. That's a 7,200 meter peak. That's the highest peak in the area. I think that's you know, it's working at like around 24,000 feet. So just a little short of being an 8,000 meter peak. Uh, so that's, that's basically that, that thing. So here's the, we get there. It's about a six hour drive, uh, six to seven hours from Kathmandu to this little town where the trekking's gonna actually start. The bulk of the distance on the road is pretty decent road, but then at the end of the road, you're onto one of those, not quite such a Jeep road from hell, but still bouncing a lot. And so that's what makes the trip long, is you can't go very fast on those roads. So this is the hotel that we stayed at, and there's my guide, uh, Surya, on the left, and uh, my porter, Sanker, and you notice he's uh, lashing together, he's. I've put it over there on the on the table. You can take a look at it. That's the duffel bag that the trekking company gives you, and you can pack your stuff in there. Normally, uh, if there's two, it's one one porter for two trekkers, uh, typically, and. As an individual in that case, you're allowed uh, 15 kilograms of weight. So two people, 30 kilograms, you're up at uh, 66 pounds. And then there's the porter's pack, which he also carries. So they're carrying a significant weight. Since I was by myself, I could exceed that 15 kilogram limit by a little bit and the porter still got a good break because he was only carrying one thing. But so lots of people um, in bigger groups, the, the porters are carrying uh, double, double bags. So it's, it's, um, it's one of the better jobs to have. I mean, the guide is the best job, but the porters at least have work. Uh, but you realize with the weights they're carrying that that's not going to be really good for your, um, your bones and your muscles. And, it, and you do that year after year, coming down, pounding on these steps, and they're going up in clogs, sandals, things oh. like that. Uh, so when I left, I, I left with my guide, my day pack, and with my porter, and one of the, I brought two sets of boots. I left one of the sets of boots with, with him. Trouble is, big Western feet are not necessarily good matches for much smaller Nepalese feet. But he was under instructions. If it doesn't work, give it to someone else or the family member. And if you can't do that, sell the damn things and use the money. Uh, but they have a hard time doing that because a gift has got more significance than it does around here. You know, around here you get something you don't like, you either save it for re-gifting to somebody else who you don't like, or, <laughs> <laughs> or you sell it, you put it on eBay and get rid of it, get the money and get something you want. And they have a hard time, if, if someone has given you a gift, it's not with the intention that it moves to someone else, it's for you. So that's a little bit of a challenge. And that's a view um, that is the, the main river, which is the um, Trisuli River, and coming out of that canyon, 
that you can sort of see off to the right, that's the Long Tong Cola coming out of there. And they're putting in a probably some kind of diversion there to run, have a run of the river uh, power generation. And then that's crossing the rivers And then for the uh, first start of the trek, you're actually on a, a dirt road because there's construction going on a couple miles up the road. So there's a, a actually nice walking to get to the, to the construction and then the real trekking begins. And occasionally you get a glimpse because you're in a lot of fairly heavy forest. Yeah, there, there do seem to be mountains out there. <laughs> Hopefully we'll see them. Lots of water coming in all over the place, lots of little waterfalls and streams and small rivers. That's how stuff moves in this part of the world, on the backs of donkeys. So there are signs all over the place, um, the trekking trails, beware the edge, avoid the edge. And you learn that especially up in the Everest region where these Donkeys are not the problem, it's yaks coming down the trail. But here it's the same thing. The, you know, typically you have a fall off on one side and mountain on the other side. If you encounter one of these uh, uh, trains of mules, horses, whatever, you get on the mountain side. If you stand too close to the edge of the cliff and a mule is, or a donkey's feeling honorary or just not paying attention, you, you're gone, knock you right off. So you gotta pay attention. We, we had lots of these come by, but it's kinda neat. And these guys are probably coming down, cause he does not carrying a big load. They're probably coming down from having delivered stuff up high. And now we're starting to break out a little bit more and uh, when we get to Gode Tabula at 10,000 feet, we'll really be pretty well out of the trees and that's when you start to really see the mountains better. But there's, there's what you start to see. And you realize, yeah, there are mountains. These are bees' nests, wild bees, just on the, ed just on the side of a cliff. So it was kind of interesting. My guide spotted them and took pictures and if, if you blew up the picture, you could see the little cells of the, of the hive. But then, finally, something big and white <laughs> shows its face. And here, we're starting to come up in the valley near Gode Tabula, which again is at 10,000 feet roughly and we're gonna be getting pretty well out of the big trees. So you'll get, start to get the nice views. And this is, um, I believe this is Long Tong Two, And it is like 6,900 meters. So the big peak is Long Tong Lerung at 7,200. This guy is nearby, not quite as tall, but it still looks big. And then this is continuing along. Across lots of rivers like that, mostly on little, they're smaller rivers, so on, or flows, so on little wooden bridges. There were a couple of suspension bridges, not too many on this trip. And if you've been on suspension bridges, you get used to them. And you, you, you know, they bounce as you walk across them, but uh, it's kind of a neat, neat feeling to just be on a bridge like that. There's more of the big peaks. And then now we're getting up near Mandu and you're up quite high now. You're up at 11,000 feet. And this peak, and I, uh, oops, I need to go to one of my notes if I can find it. The name of the peak just doesn't roll off my lips very well. This is Kongchempo. 
6,300 meters. And, and to me, is, is just a beautiful mountain. And it's one, like I say, this is like a north-south range, and you're approaching it from the west. So sunrise is behind this mountain range, so the sun comes up over the range. So you, you don't get any of the real spectacular morning lighting because of where the sun happens to be, inconsiderate of it, but that's where it is, and how the mountains are arranged. But you get a little bit, not a lot. While we were at Mandu, uh, we were able to go visit a small Buddhist monastery where they were having some religious ceremonies and went in, had uh, hot nyak tea, uh, and yak is a male, so you should never ask for yak milk. <laughs> but that's what everybody says. You te technically you want nyak milk. The N in the front is a female. But a lot of chanting and, and music in there. Some of the statues of the various Buddhas in the back. And what do you think these are? What? Cow pies. Cow pies. Well, actually, usually yak pies. <laughs> Uh, but they're being dried out because they're going to be used for fuel. fuel. Uh, yeah, they'll burn it in the winter. And there's that peak again. And it's, like I say, this is just gorgeous. Yeah. <coughs> and there's we're, feet, what? Uh, let's see, it was, uh, this guy, 6,300, to, to convert, multiply by three, okay, so 6,300 by three is uh, a little over, you know, 18,000, then add 10%, so 18,000 plus 18 uh, takes you to 19,8, and then with a little bit of rounding and everything, 20,000 feet. See, he was a man. Yeah, so about 20 feet. Yeah, so I, that was one of my gifts to Nepal is I taught my guide how to do that. Of course, he says, well, I just do it on my watch. <laughs> but it's handy because to go from feet to meters takes more work. But to go from meters to feet is actually a, something you can roughly do in your head and get a feeling for and you should notice the telephone pole, or not the power poles. There is small scale hydroelectric in many of these areas that cr create electricity. So um, you have lights at night um, and, and things of that nature, which is kind of nice. They still don't have enough for a lot of refrigeration. So once you get up high, don't eat meat, basically. Uh, you, one, of, one of the delights of uh, trekking is uh, tuna fish pizza uh, because tuna comes in cans. It doesn't have to be refrigerated. And that's a picture, that's the Long Tong Cola. And this is uh, coming up past Mandu, heading to Kyanjin Gompa which is going to be the high point for sleeping. And so that peak in the middle is the one that you've been seeing close-ups of, the big white face. And this is interesting. The, the uh, Kanchin Gampa is down in here, roughly down at the base of these. And I'm going to go up to here. This is the Misery Ridge equivalent, uh, that'll take me to about 15.4, 15.5, or 14.4, 14.5. This is from where we were staying, just looking up. And, and you know, it's telephoto, so it's not like this peak is about to fall over onto you. They're quite a ways away. And up at the top, that's the viewpoint. 
to go for a picture, to go for a view, and you'll see it. And this Kanjin Gompa, lots of large, large buildings there, probably all reconstructed or newly constructed after the earthquake. They had lots of damage in the Long Tong Valley, as you will see. But all sort of bright colors, so it's kind of neat, real contrast. And this says the higher guest house <laughs> on the building right here. And every night, clouds would come in on the peaks. And sometimes even down into the village, so it was like a fog. And you go, oh, cuss word, the, uh, the weather's closing in. It's going to go to hell. Next morning, clear as a bell. So sun every day, no rain. And then this is shots from up on the viewpoint. Porter on the left, guide on the right. <laughs> Behind them, going out of the picture, that's Long Tong Lirung, the 7,200 meter peak. What's on the right hand side there where the flags are? Uh, let's, hang on. Whoops. Oh, I went too many. Let me. Just a little cairn. Okay, so yeah. do you sign or leave a note or something? That no, there, there's. They're not into that particularly. You take a picture. Big glacial ice flow coming down. You can see more people. You can go out that ridge quite a ways. Another shot of that glacier. This is a shot up the valley the river is coming out of a valley when it flows past the village, and this is the shot up that river. And that's the town. <laughs> it's down below you a ways. And so the, the going up, you know, there's some places where your feet will slip, but uh, the going up is not so bad. It's the coming down on, on little uh, ball bearings, essentially, on these mm. rocks. And the axe, keep an eye on you. Big boss yak. Some more pictures. This is back in Mondu, where we came back down. And again, enjoying the scenery. It's just gorgeous. And that's kind of your morning sun on the mountains. You don't get a lot just because of where the sun is coming up and where the mountains are located. And these are some shots from the Mani walls. These are at entrances and exits of towns and they're Buddhist sayings and mantras and basically to, to try and bring good upon the village. Bless the people there. And they can be quite extensive. Technically, um, if you're following tradition, you'll pass a Mani wall to the left of the wall. So there'll be, when you get to a Mani wall, the trail will split and go around it. And if you're walking, you should stay to the left. And when you come back, you'll be on the other side. Whoops. Then, one of the places where we didn't stay was Long Tong Village. And this is a shot that I took. And if you look back here, you can see this little building. And it's kind of tucked into an overhang. When the earthquake hit in 2015, this was the only building left standing in Long Tong Village. A giant uh, landslide combined with the earthquake and the breaking off of a glacier up above came crashing down into this area, buried the rest of the village. No one's sure how many people died up there. The estimate is 300, and there's at least 100 bodies that have never been recovered. So it's, it's kind of sobering 
because you don't think about it when you're trekking, but you're walking across a mass grave. The trekking trail comes right up through there. Yeah, there's there's movies about it. Yes. Yeah. This is what the village looked like before the earthquake and the landslide. That's what it looked like afterwards. And the whole area, the whole Langtang area was heavily impacted by the earthquake. And so it's, it's first recovering. So I actually was going to essentially end the talk now. And I said, you know, that, it's kind of depressing <laughs> looking at that. <laughs> so I tacked on another slide just of mountain views. And that, that picks me up. So we'll do that. So that's sunrise coming up over those mountains. So just sequence of views. A little bit of morning sun. And then the top of a mountain. And then on the left <laughs> are porter and guide. On the right is Intrepid Trekker. <laughs> Third Rock Adventures is the outfit that I went with. I feel very good about it. Like I said, they were able to turn on a dime and get me onto this trek from the one. Uh, the only added expense I had was for a, a Jeep ride from Kathmandu to the start of this trek. It wasn't built in, and I, I needed a new permit. Everything else they covered. And that included more days in uh, hotels. And then here's the contact info for 10 friends. And certainly, if you have questions about 10 friends, you can talk to me. I see, saw some other folks from 10 friends here. So. Tell them there's a fundraiser in December. Yeah, there is a, a, a fundraiser that we're going to be doing. Uh, and I, we is not right. It's actually the Muse Club at Cascades Academy puts this on for us. Uh, and it's a, a silent auction and uh, essentially doll bot dinner. Uh, that'll be held at Cascades Academy on December 7th, which is a Thursday evening. The price is very reasonable. I think they, they raised it to $15 this year <laughs> for a dinner and, and the auction and, and some presentations. Um, and, Again, if you go to the website, the 10 Friends website, you'll see connections there. So I'd urge you to go and learn about 10 Friends. They do really wonderful work over there. That's why I'm involved. So with that, I want to thank you for joining me for a, a, a trek in Nepal. Happy to answer questions. Uh, <laughs>